All right. Well, good morning, everybody. This morning, um, I am speaking on this wonderful idea that all things work together for good. You've probably heard that saying. You've probably heard it many times. It's been said many times in many places. Even in the Netflix series uh, Manifest, uh, which I watched um, recently, you know, in that, in that series, it's kind of the running theme of that drama, that all things work together for good. And it comes, of course, from scripture. It comes from the Apostle Paul. He wrote in a letter that he sent to the Romans when actually he was in prison. In Romans 8, 28, we read, all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. You know, in, in doing um, spiritual count counseling over the years, I've had people ask me, you know, how can we really feel that all things work together for good, that they're working together for good when things sometimes look bad? You know, they, they can look really bad. And so the answer is, is actually pretty complex. It's a complex one, and that's what I wanted to explore today. In my talk, um, a few weeks ago, I was describing my experience of losing my home in the campfire. And I shared that, you know, in all that loss, I gained something really precious and really priceless. And I realized what I gained was that I knew in the depth of my being that I trust life no matter what, that I trust life implicitly, because I know that life is good. I know that God is incredibly loving and benign. Albert Einstein, um, one of our greatest scientists, greatest scientists of all time, said, the most important decision we make is whether we believe we live in a friendly or hostile universe. Think about that for a minute. Think about what you believe. What do you believe? Is this a friendly universe? Is this a benign universe? Or is it a hostile universe? And how do we describe a friendly universe? I actually, I, I found a great description um, in this article I read from Jeff Bell. He's a newscaster, author, mental health advocate. And he describes a friendly universe this way. A fundamentally supportive life system that provides for me and all other living beings to the full extent that we're willing to draw on it in ways that serve a universal greater good. There's a lot packed in that statement. I'm going to read it again. This is a, a friendly universe, a fundamentally supportive life system that provides for me and all other living beings to the full extent that we're willing to draw on it in ways that serve a universal greater good. So in other words, if we draw on this supportive life system to support a universal greater good, good for all, then we'll be taken care of. It's, it's kind of a contemporary way of saying all things work together for good for those who love spirit and live according to spirit's purpose. Spirit's purpose, we could, we could, um, we could define as the greater good of all, you know, always blessing, always blessing for the greater good. Now, it, it may not and it often does not outpicture in, in us always getting what we desire, right? And that's in part because this universe sees a much bigger picture than we ourselves can truly comprehend. And I have a great story uh, that makes this point beautifully. Once upon a time, there was this king who had a servant he spent a lot of time with, and they became good friends. And the king got a kick out of the servant and his extremely positive attitude because he would always say, no matter what happened, it's all good. It's all good. Well, one day they were out hunting, and they were talking, and the servant was distracted. And he put too much gunpowder in the gun, and when the king shot the gun, he blasted off his thumb. And the king said, oh, no. And the servant said, no, it's all good. Well, the king didn't think so. 
and he thought he would have to give his servant some kind of punishment because you can't be setting an example that if you cause the king bodily harm, that's okay and it goes unpunished. So the servant was tried and sentenced to six years in prison. Well, about a year later, the king was out on a trip across the country and he was captured by a cannibalistic tribe. And they were about to lower him into a big pot of boiling water when the leader noticed he was missing his thumb and he shouted, stop, we don't eat imperfect food. <laughs> and so they dumped the king by the edge of their camp and he got away. Well, he started thinking of his servant and how if he hadn't lost his thumb, he would have lost his life. So he got back to the kingdom and he pardoned his servant. And when he saw the servant, he apologized for him having to spend a year in prison. And the servant said, no, it's all good. If I hadn't been in prison, I would have been with you on that trip. <laughs> yeah. So the moral of this story is that we often judge things as bad immediately, right? Without considering there's a bigger picture. There's a wider view that often comes into view later in our lives. And we often, we often see the purpose of things only later, you know, after we've gone through something really challenging. And later on, we can see the good we couldn't see before. You know, I've, I've heard people say this about their cancer diagnosis, a cancer diagnosis and the, their journey through that. And I can say um, now that there's actually a lot of good that is still coming out of my experience of losing my home in the fire. And one thing that I, I really realize is how perfect it was for me to be your minister at this time because I've gained a far better understanding of what you were going through in Tahoe, you know, with the fire and the evacuation. That compassion, that hard-earned compassion from having a direct experience is something I gained. That is good. That is really something that will bless me uh, from now on. It takes time, though, to integrate and experience and discover how it facilitated our growth. In the Revealing Word, uh, which is a metaphysical dictionary uh, written by Charles Fillmore, the founder of Unity, um, he describes optimism as the inclination to expect good. The inclination to expect good. The practice of seeing God all good everywhere. He describes it as a sturdy belief in the goodness of reality. A sturdy belief belief in the goodness of reality. Sturdy means solid, solid belief. And so if we can program our minds, specifically our subconscious mind, to expect good, to practice seeing good, seeing God, seeing good everywhere, we will create it. Now Jesus said, it is done unto you as you believe. That is such a deep, deep teaching. Maybe we can't fully know for a fact. We can't fully know for a fact this is a friendly, loving universe. But if we choose to believe that, then we'll likely create that. So a good question uh, is, what are we affirming in our minds every day? You know, what are we believing? Um, it's all good or it's all bad right now or probably more likely it's a mixed bag. Now, I'm not saying, you know, stick your head in, in the sand and deny reality. I'm not saying that. You know, when I, when, I, um, when I saw my house after the campfire, I couldn't pretend it wasn't a pile of ashes, right? I had to fully acknowledge the reality and meet that shock and grief. And it didn't feel good at that time, right? But I did trust the experience and trust that I would grow from it. Because as Eckhart Tolle says, you get to a point where you use everything to evolve. Use everything to evolve. And at some point, I knew that I would see good. I would see the good that came from it. Joe Dispenza, um, wonderful author and teacher, he says we have to think bigger than our circumstances, bigger than pandemics, bigger than health scares and wildfires and all the things that scare us. 
I highly recommend his book, um, Breaking, um, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Really, he has such excellent insights on how we transform our subconscious mind, um, also called the unconscious mind, and increase our good and our capacity to create that. He says, here's a great quote, he says, there is a powerful intelligence within you that is giving you life, which loves you so much. When your will matches its will, when your mind matches its mind, when your love for life mat matches its love for you, it always responds. I love the last line, when your love for life matches its love for you. In other words, when we're loving life, we're aligned with spirit. You know, we're empowered co-creators when we're loving life. And that explains that second part of the scripture, all things work together for good for those who love God. Because isn't loving God loving life? God is life. Life is God. And in that, that same letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, he offered another bit of advice. He said, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't conform to the pattern of this world that's reminding you all the time how limited you are and how bad things are. Don't conform to that pattern. But instead, be transformed. Be transformed, not conformed, to the renewing of your mind. Uh, Joe Dispenza describes the renewing of our mind as the science of changeology. I like that, changeology. It means the science of changing your mind and throwing out the mental trash, right? Just sweeping it out of your mind. <laughs> and it's based on the, pres on the premise that our environment, everything we're experiencing in our circumstance, is an extension of our mind as it is within, so it is without. So let's examine um, the way both unity teachings, they're actually so similar, similar to Joe Dispenza. Charles Fillmore would have loved Joe Dispenza. Um, the way that they both explore the three modes of mind. They are the superconscious, the subconscious, and the conscious mind. And of course, it's one mind, but these are three aspects, and they're, they're very different. The conscious mind is what is aware in us. It's a sense of self-awareness. It's what's, what we're most familiar with, you know. It's, it's um, you know, where we feel most normal and at home. It is in the now. It's aware of where we are and what we think and how we feel. The superconscious mind is the place in us that is timeless, that is awake awareness. All those names for God that you spoke last week, that, that I am. The Christ consciousness, as, as Charles Fillmore calls it, the I am that I am. The subconscious mind is like our hard drive. It's the sum of all our past thinking. And you can think of it like a storage unit of the mind, a storage unit we've had our whole lives. Our mental storage unit where we've put all our beliefs, all our conditioning, all our habits, and all our patterns. And it's, it's all our memory. It's our memory. It's also called the unconscious, subconscious, unconscious. And you know, when someone says don't don't go don't go unconscious, it means that you're you're acting from an automatic program um, that's in your your mental storage unit. You're just kind of reacting without thinking. And uh, Dispenza says that 95% of who we are is is this subconscious, is, uh, is a set of unconscious thoughts and, and automatic programs and repetitive habits, emotional reactions, and memorized behaviors, okay? And quite often, all that programming, it keeps us stuck in behaving ways that we often wish we didn't behave, right? And so it takes effort to change, but the good news is it is very possible. It is very possible to renew the subconscious mind. You know, a lot of um, a lot of relationships when you're young and you haven't begun your spiritual journey. You know, you haven't even begun to work on yourself. I, I tell you know people they're really a lot like a set of um, patterns meeting a set of patterns. It's kind of one person's conditioning meeting another person's conditioning. You just see if your conditioning gets along with the other conditioning. Um, 
conscious relationship is this other thing. And that's where both people are really committed to looking at all that conditioning and all those patterns and all those behaviors and refining them, you know, um, growing and becoming more conscious, right? So here's an example. I've got an example, personal example. Growing up, my mom was um, always able to push my buttons like no one else, like no one else. <laughs> and I, I, had, I had a lot of self-control with, with anyone else. But when it came to my mom, you know, you know she just had this knack for um, pushing my buttons. She knew exactly how to. She had this unique ability to get a reaction out of me and often an angry one, right, to react um, out of anger. And so over my entire lifetime, over many years, I, I've worked on this so much. I've really worked hard on this uh, relationship with my mom. And I'm really happy to say that these days I don't react anymore. I had an experience just last week and I, I was so happy to, to um, witness, just observe that, wow, I am not reacting. I am really free. I have really gotten to a place of making that behavior that was reactive conscious where I have choice, right? Done a lot of healing work and it's paid off. And and the, the, the process over those years was realizing I don't like the way I feel when I'm angry and reacting, right? And so I, I learned to be mindful. I learned to be aware. And you know, in those moments where I might react, I learned to breathe and create space and embrace and take care of my reaction and anger and have healthy boundaries and wait till I'm centered and conscious and then respond. Um, you know, in younger years, I would, I would go unconscious, you know, the, the reactive pattern would kick in. And so, you know, it took a lot of work, but I changed that factory setting and it's been updated to like a much better program now, you know, and I think it's actually really helping my mom to also not be in that pattern right? Not, not react and not, you know, want to get that reaction, right? So because 95% of who we are is this subconscious program, programming, that's where our work lies. And, um, you know, if we want to clear limiting ways of being and manifest more of our super conscious capacity, the super conscious is where we're creative. That's where we create a new reality. So we begin by getting better at observing. You know, we, we become the observer. We become the witness. We watch ourselves. We watch our thoughts. We watch our perceptions. We watch our behaviors. We watch our emotions and our reactions. So I want to share with you um, something that I like to share in workshops. Again, it's just because it's so practical and helpful. And at this point, I mean, you might want to take notes because this is a wonderful four-step process. But if you don't, if you just want to listen, you know, please do. And this talk's being recorded, so you can always um, watch. You can always watch it later and then take notes. But it's a four-step process from, from Joe Dispenza's work. And it describes how we do this work of transforming our subconscious habits, right, that, that, that limit us. So the four steps. The first one. We change our brain waves through the practice of meditation. Okay, you know Joe talks about we don't just meditate just just for no reason. We change our brain waves. That's that's you know why we're meditating. So if you don't already meditate, you'll want to start giving at least 15 minutes a day to doing silent or uh, guided meditation. And when we meditate, we we move from beta, which is our normal state to alpha or theta. In beta, we're more in a survival mode, just, you know, getting things done, taking care of surviving. But in alpha and, and in theta, we're in a creative mode. We are accessing in alpha and theta the superconscious mind. That's how we open that direct line to superconscious mind. And that's the mode where we create health and order and love and joy and expansion and connectedness and all possibility, right? So we meditate. And then the next three steps are self-reflective. You know, once you're in meditation, you self-reflect. We get still. And then the second step, we recognize. We recognize, we see 
the problem we want to change. Like with my mom, I saw that it was this reacting with anger, right? You know, maybe there's someone we, we react to fairly often with, with irritation or blame or frustration, and it doesn't feel good. So in this step, we just want to recognize what we want to change. And, and then there's a writing practice. Um, and we, I, we journal and we ask three questions. Three questions. The first question, what kind of person have I been? And we're just writing for ourselves. No one's reading it. So we're honest. What kind of person have I been? Is there a feeling or experience I struggle with nearly every day? And what's one thing I want to change about myself? These are great, great self-reflection questions all the time. They're really important questions to ask. You know, our answer might be something like, I want to stop feeling so much self-doubt. Um, or I, I want to stop feeling shame. I want to stop feeling fear. I want to stop feeling anger. And as we write, we also want to take note. Again, we're observing to see um, how this unwanted emotion that we're getting in touch with, that we're recognizing, feels in our body. Okay, and we could write about that. So the next step, um, <clears throat> number three, it has two parts, and that is admitting and declaring. We admit and declare what we see without any judgment, right? In other words, we tell the truth to ourselves about what behavior or habit doesn't feel good and what we really want to change. And it's, import it's important to remember we are only admitting this to a higher power, right? Not to another person with an ego. Just we know that in that loving higher power, there is no judgment. There's no judgment. It's not about judging. It's about transforming. <coughs> there's no blaming. There's no punishing. There's no rejection. There's no loss of love. There's only help and support. <coughs> so again, we admit in this admitting and then we declare it's helpful to write, journal. And we write to our higher power what we've gotten in touch with. So here's an example of what we might write. You know, I act like I'm confident when actually I struggle really hard with self-doubt. Or I pretend to be happy, but I'm really suffering inside because I'm lonely. I'm so lonely, right? We, we connect with unconditionally loving spirit and tell the truth about where we're having difficulty. We know that it's, it's compassionate. And then that second part, the declaring, we can just say out loud. It's kind of, we just consolidate. We say, I've been feeling self-doubt, or we can just say self-doubt. We just name it, or we name it if it's anger. Whatever it is, we declare it. And what that does is it, it, it kind of brings it fully out of the unconscious into the conscious mind. So the fourth and last step is that we surrender then. We give it to God. We let go and let God. We give it to that greater power. And that means we just let go of control and we ask for help, right? We ask our higher power to help us transform these difficult states of mind or feelings um, or habits or thinking, way that we're thinking and feeling. And this is, you know, where we really bring in that trust, um, that, that it is a friendly universe and it, it is a friendly, loving, benign creator, right? That only wants our growth, that just celebrates us becoming more unlimited by just clearing these limitations of these habits and patterns and ways of being that don't feel good, right? And so we open to this outcome. You know, and we open to an outcome maybe we haven't thought of yet. You know, it's like we, it, there's a beautiful teaching uh, for Dispenza. He says, you know, ask God for uh, the greatest thing you can think of and then a surprise, you know, even more great than we can figure out, we can imagine a greater good that Spirit wants to bless us with that brings greater joy and freedom into our lives. And again, this last step, you know, we, we can do some writing and journaling and we, we want to write, you know, to, to, we want to write to the higher power. Could be something like this. Universal mind within me. 
universal mind within me, I forgive my worries, my anxieties, and my concerns, and I give them to you. And I trust that you have the mind to resolve them much better than I could. I open and I allow you to provide a greater life that, that is just right, that is just right for me. So um, those four steps, I know that's a lot, but in review, you know, we meditate, we recognize what we want to change, we admit it and declare it, bring it, bring it into the conscious mind, and then we surrender and we give it to spirit. This, this is just a very practical way we can work on ourselves, that we can transform and renew the mind, and specifically the subconscious. You know, like the, the song I sang, A New Reality, you know, that last verse, don't, don't tell me stories about your fear and doubt, about the gifts that you've been born without. You've got everything you need to succeed. You've got unlimited creativity. So don't give up on your dreams because you can create a new reality. We can create a new reality. Um, last thing before I go. Um, there's a great question to ask yourself often. What would it be like to, what would it be like to, what would it be like to, and then finish that sentence. Be free of self-doubt. What would it be like to write that inspiring book, to become a minister, right? To, to lose 10 pounds, right? To not react with irritation to that person, <laughs> to feel serenity instead. What would it be like to? And then let your, your super conscious mind fill you with the ideas for your greater good. Okay. So in closing, um, I hope, you know, my hope today was to really empower us more just by reminding you what you already know, but by becoming even more enthusiastic about shaping your life, right? And shaping your reality and your day to day experience. So let us affirm the intelligence within and all around me allows me to create a new reality every day. I choose and welcome ever greater good and joy and peace and love and happiness. I receive that. I open to that. And so it is. Thank you, creator. Thank you. Amen. And thank you all. Um, thank you, Reverend Kathy. <clears throat> I look forward to re. re